Putin or Berlin would like to welcome everyone to the mind and its potential. This is a um, class number four of a seven day um, course. It's about understanding the central role of mind or consciousness. Um, Justin Jenkins is our teacher and he um, has studied at both um, Nairobi University and Maya Tripa, Maya Tripta, I trip over that every time, and is also a current student at Maya Tripa. Um, thank you, Justin, for helping or giving us your knowledge. Thanks for that. So actually, yeah, uh, I'm back at Naropa again. So I went Naropa, my Tripa, back to Naropa. <laughs> Waiting for a Tilopa University to start, or Mar maybe Marpa. I think there's a Marpa Institute somewhere. <laughs> Milarepa College would be an interesting one that might feel like more retreat, uh, PhD or something. Um, yes, welcome everybody. Uh, hope you had a nice day today. Um, yeah, so today's uh, class four, and um, we will talk about um, cultivation of positive emotions or wholesome emotions, and a little bit of uh, working with uh, the negative emotions that we talked about last week. And then we'll do uh, Maybe somewhere halfway in or somewhere about we'll do um, a loving kindness practice. So one of the subjects of the book. So we'll do an experiential exercise um, of what we'll be talking about this evening. It's a very simple um, contemplation or visualization practice that's kind of universal across Buddhist traditions and um, yeah, very nice to do. Um, yeah. And then maybe, maybe to start, we can just take a few minutes just to do some settling, allow ourselves to kind of uh, let, let any of the uh, rumblings of the day go and give ourselves some space to uh, relax and become more present so that we can kind of engage and uh, listen and kind of uh, interact more deeply together. And so I invite you to just to kind of check in with your body. And feel yourself sitting in your seat. And you're doing a simple scan through the body, releasing the tension. Letting the spine become upright and relaxed. And this can be helpful even before moving to paying attention to the breath, just kind of being with the body very directly, simply. Releasing any tension as you can. Becoming aware of the sensations that are moving to the body and feelings in the body. You notice. And you can move your attention if you like when you're ready to your breathing and the feeling of the breathing. It moves in and out. If it's comfortable, you can notice the move 
the movement of the breath and the abdomen and the chest, the sensations around the nostrils that was comfortable. Being careful not to set any sense of goals or trying to really do anything. It's more of just the kind of I'm letting go of the doing. I'm not trying to create any state, really just kind of relaxing distractions or tensions. Giving the mind permission to just simply be present and aware of the feelings of the breath, feelings of the body. We can just continue to be present with that breath. Allowing whatever is in the system, whatever is in whatever thoughts in the space you're in. You can bring the sense of acceptance. Just observing the kind of openness and curiosity. Acceptance to whatever is there for you. Allowing it the space to move on its own. I wanted it to be there as you breathe. <laughs>
Now you can take a moment to connect with an inspiration for a spiritual practice. So connecting with what inspires us in the teachings, pulls us towards the teachings. Our interest in just yearning our desire. Um, for a spiritual, a spiritual life or a spiritual path. And holding that inspiration with a sense of compassion. Acknowledging our, the compassion we have for ourselves and the world. And living beings on this planet. And seeing that inspiration as our intention for exploring these topics together tonight. If you like, you're welcome to join me in uh, reciting the refuge and bodhicitta prayer in the class. You're welcome just to read. Go for refuge and tell an enlightened Buddha, Dharma, and Supreme Assembly are the merits I create to listening to the Dharma. May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. You go for refuge and tell an enlightened to the Buddha, Dharma, and Supreme Assembly. The merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge and tell enlightenment to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. The merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all beings have happiness and its causes. May all beings be free from suffering and its causes. May all beings never be separated from pure joy. May all beings abide in equanimity, free from bias and attachment to our brain. Okay, yeah, so just check in real quick. So last week we um, explored a model, kind of a, a map from Geshe Tashi Sirin about um, um, say kind of the disturbing emotions or negative emotions or unwholesome emotions and the kind of um, uh, what's the word? They're kind of like the the branching out, like the the Buddhist understanding of how our difficult emotions come from more subtler roots and kind of branch out into uh, grosser expressions of kind of uh, emotional states that were more common. 
commonly familiar with. So kind of uh, the deepest level, the, inst the instinct instinctual kind of reactivity of um, aversion, attraction, and indifference, uh, which is which stem from the kind of very deep um, uh, clinging to self-image, clinging to self. Uh, um, uh, self-preservation meanness. Um, and then kind of stronger emotions of self-contraction or self-fixation. Self um, which then kind of activate anger, jealousy, pride, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Let me show the chart again. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a lot, so we won't go into this much tonight, but I just wanted to kind of show it reference because the, the next uh, chart of pulse and emotions is kind of a mirror to this. So again, a fundamental confusion of self, things, and events. It's kind of primary, like a kind of primal duality that's created. Leads to again that attraction, aversion, difference, discontent, self-centeredness, agitation. Um, kind of. Um, which then lead us to kind of solidify views of the world that are kind of mistaken or you know superiority complexes or misguided. Um, and these can be religious in nature. Or they can, or they can be kind of dogmatic. Kind of, uh, they can be secular. They can be kind of people uh, related to work, uh, they can be political. You know, kind of social influence, social, socially influenced views that we kind of adapt to, take on, based that are kind of expressions or reifications of these kind of um, confu confused, subtle or confused states of agitation, discontent, maybe woundedness. You know, some you could say like, you know, you know, people who have very Intense emotional wounding can sometimes be more subject to extreme, you know, kind of extremist views. Like we look at, like, you know, some of the supremacist movements. Usually, there's a lot of kind of um, deep wounding and insecurity that drives these views. Um, and then, yeah, and then those lead into different flavors of suffering. <laughs> Or different styles of imprisonment. One, uh, two, from, uh, um, styles of self imprisonment. So, and Geshitashi, this isn't a traditional list. This is kind of a, a map that he he created. Um, that have yeah flavors of anger kind of come come from the root of ignorance, come from the root of attachment. Um, and so these zones that Kishitash talked about are kind of the subtleties. So the third zones are really kind of up, really present for us in our attention. Although if those may be, we might not be aware of them too, but it doesn't take too much investigation to notice like, oh yeah, I'm actually, I'm feeling jealous right now. Oh, I'm feeling grief, uh, I feel laziness or whatever. Um, and, but the second zone states are difficult to connect with and kind of have to do some really kind of deeper investigations to notice them. And that's where meditation comes in because we can start to have more stillness that like the, the still, you know, the, the stillness that comes from 
uh, meditation because it's basically like cleaning the mirror so we can see more clearly what's going on in us. And then the most subtle, the first zone is very, uh, very difficult to see. And that comes from very deep meditation practice. Um, so let's look at some positive stuff this <laughs> time. Um, so these are wholesome functions of our mind. Um, and again, Kishitashi uses the zone, third zone again, more uh, coarser, subtler, more subtle. Um, so these are the ones that we want to kind of, that are supportive of our well being and also supportive of our spiritual journey. And is this, can you see okay, or should I zoom in? You're still on unwholesome mental factors. Nothing has changed. Unwholesome? Unwholesome, yes. Unwholesome. Oh. Correct. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So yeah, so some wholesome emotional states that we want. Some are emotional and some are cognitive. So confidence, optimism, joy, equanimity, friendliness, more of the kind of emotional um, atmospheres we want to start to cultivate in ourselves. And then mindfulness, and then a correct understanding of cause and effect. Calmness, maybe more cognitive in nature. Yeah, and maybe actually there's one other chart I'll show you here. Can you see this triangle or? Yeah, great, okay. It's just, yeah. Um, so in terms of um, concentration, ethics, and wisdom are called the three higher trainings. And this kind of breaks down Buddhist practice in a nutshell, like everything falls into these kind of three categories. Basically. Um, yeah, and the triangle is a nice picture because ethics is kind of the foundation that allows your kind of meditation and wisdom to develop, which are more kind of subtler kind of um, in nature. And ethics. You know, I'd almost like to say like value-based ethics. So I feel like ethics as an expression of values. So not just simply being good, being good or behaving better or you know like changing your behavior, but changing your behavior based on um, uh, values. So based on your values of compassion, peace quality, love, and so forth. Um, having those, those values infused with your ethical practice. And then um, ethics kind of tying into uh, aspects of the Eightfold Noble Path. So the kind of eight tips that the Buddha gave in terms of uh, what a spiritual path Element eight elements of the spiritual path, and so these are kind of just starting to watch uh, our efforts. So, what are we putting our energy into? Um, because, uh, yeah, what are we putting our energy into? 
Um, watching our actions of our body, and watching our actions of speech, our, our livelihood, making sure our livelihood is not uh, destructive. Because, you know, it's, um, yeah, not harmful. And then, yeah, and then getting in touch. So these these positive emotions are confidence, optimism, joy, friendliness. Um, these come about through kind of contemplation. So real, like an active, constant realignment. Um, checking in, um, re uh, reaffirming, maybe a discovering um, bases of confidence, bases of optimism, bases of joy. You know, why should I be joyful? Why should I be optimistic? How can I be? What should I be confident in? You know, these, these aren't necessarily um, kind of, some people might have, you know, there are people like are hap, uh, like happy-go-lucky. <laughs> um, we're, we're hearing a teaching from uh, Paul Nopper in the one time. They say, oh, you know, happy-go-lucky is maybe not a bad, you know, maybe not so bad, you know. A bit of an easygoing kind of nature uh, to us. Yeah, so cultivating confidence, optimism, joy is a, kind of a ref needing to come back and reflect. So, you know, when we do prayers like the refuge and bodhicitta prayer, this is again, it's like it's coming back, touch, it's a it's an opportunity to um, water those seeds of confidence, optimism, joy. And taking refuge is like going is is um, that's what you're taking refuge in. You're taking refuge in this potential. You're taking refuge in the, uh, um, the positive nature of our mind, the compassionate nature of our mind, um, the potential for liberation, the the record the affirmation or recognition that um, a mind can be peaceful and easygoing and not attached. Mind can be um, courageous and um, and so that's you know whenever you do Buddhist uh, practice usually we start off with refuge in bodhicitta as a way to kind of set the tone and create that internal atmosphere of these uh, positive mental factors, uh, positive elements of mind. And the same with equanimity. So equanimity, friendless, and look at the, um, may I become a Buddha, this, this idea, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. This is applying, uh, implying a lot. Uh, so in order to benefit all sentient beings, it's implying that you want to benefit all sentient beings. <laughs> Why would I want to benefit all sentient beings? Especially the all part, you know. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the called recognition of equ equanimity, seeing the equality of all beings, seeing that all beings have... Um, this basic goodness to them, this basic potential to them. And based on that, uh, we have a sense, we break down the bias, fear, competitiveness, and so forth, and we're left with a sense of friendliness, connection, 
And so our striving and inspiration to become Buddhas is to kind of manifest that equanimity friendliness, and friendliness and peace to its fullest extent in relationship to others, to, to benefit others. And then when this sense of equanimity and friendliness is there, it automatically regulates our nervous system, calms us down, we feel rooted, we feel connected, not isolated. It brings the, the energy of joy and optimism and warmth. And with this with a sense of these um, uh, positive emotions and calm, then mindfulness becomes easier. Uh, because there's less, less agitation in the mind, less agitation in the nervous system. Um, it's easy to put our mind on what we want to put it on. You know, another quote from uh, thing that Pumla Brim Shay was saying, you know, the, the path itself is very easy. It's just that we're not. <laughs> You know, just sit there, you know, like when we think about it, just sit there and, and just look at your breathing. You know, like it's like literally the easiest thing in the world to do, but it's so hard to do. So the instructions themselves are quite easy. The path is quite easy in a, in a way. Um, it's just all of our, all of our stuff, all the agitation, the, the kind of patterns of the, the well, the, the waves of uh, emotions and um, that uh, cloud and make that make it complex, you know, the tension and so forth. Stuff that working through um, working through our stuff is is what makes it challenge. Um, so when those aren't in our space, the all these support mindfulness. And then saying the uh, correct understanding of cause and effect, it's kind of seen our interconnection, you know, seen our inter interconnection, um, seeing our actions matter in the world. When I'm more easygoing and happy and more peaceful, it, that uh, kind of radiates out and affects other people, affects my environment. Um, if I'm not, that also affects um, myself and others. So we start to have more of a kind of realistic and clear kind of relationship uh, to uh, how we function and how others function, how the, the, the earth functions. And then that all these mental states make support these um, um, practices, effort, action, speech. So our effort will be will be will be putting our effort in in um, nourishing uh, endeavors. You know, our our, our effort, our our, our work. Um, aren't coming from places of um, unconscious motivations. You know, like what's motivating me to kind of put my energy into this? Um, and so when we're more conscious of our, our motivation, the effort will be uh, more nourishing, more wise. Um, and so then we've got a good atmosphere, good starting point, the lead that can help us move down into the second zone, which are deeper states of mind. And just how she puts um, loving kindness, compassion, 
altruism. Uh, here, Kam, the specific state of Kama body, it's called Shine in Tibetan or Shamata in Sanskrit. So this isn't just the state of calmness, but this is actually the kind of achievement of um, perfectly balanced uh, mind, which then makes it, and then these make it possible for a constancy of mindfulness and constancy of uh, um, intentional um, living intentional alignment. So we have a long-term, we're operating in our long-term view. So our short-term behavior and long-term view are in alignment actually. It's a very profound place. Any questions, comments, anything kind of coming up for people? Justin, I have a question, um, and I'm sorry to have missed last week because uh, I think part of this question goes back to, I think, what you covered last week. Um, but where you have, you know, wholesome and unwholesome, right? It, you know, so it implies good and bad. Um, I had this discussion with a very experienced licensed therapist recently, you know, have this wheel of emotions and, you know, even suggestions that if you're not feeling things like anger, you're suppressing these natural emotions that are naturally occurring, right? And, um, you know, not putting a good and a bad on any emotions, you know, just, you know, suggesting, you know, as a human, you experience all these emotions and you may be suppressing certain emotions if you don't feel things like anger, or jealousy, or you know some of the bad emotions. So how do you? I know you spent a lot of time on, you know, this kind of discussion. I mean, how do you feel about the good and versus bad, and and you know, wholesome and unwholesome uh, with that overall wheel of emotions? Yeah, yeah, it's a valid. Uh... Um, yeah, there's a definite uh, danger in having this kind of dualistic map um, where you have this good, kind of good and bad um, because that, you know, all of our super, you know, the, you got to fight the bad, you know, conquer the bad. <laughs> Lots of armies and swords and whatever. Um, so that can, you know, there's danger there where it can create kind of inner conflict and kind of inner, uh, kind of inner aggression um, towards or suppression, um, fear. Yeah. Um, So yeah, so yeah, maybe we can shift a little bit. Yeah, so this kind of comes into, so yeah, so talking about suppression, antidoting, or or just give, maybe what your therapist is talking, kind of giving space and more of an accepting, like, you know, we just have to kind of ex allow kind of genuine, like what we're feeling, giving space to what we're feeling. Um, I think what that, approach to saying it's, it's not like, oh, anytime you feel angry, you just go, you know, hit, you know, maybe you need to punch five people a day and then, you know, uh, you know, hug five people a day or, you know, what, you know, like just kind of go with the flow kind of thing. It's not really, it's more, I think, giving space. So there is like that suppression thing. Um, And I do, yeah, I do find that personally quite powerful because I, I think I do, per, personally, I can kind of lead to kind of a, the, 
uh, suppress suppressive or kind of um, combative kind of relationship with my experience or my emotions, which then just leads to repet. It doesn't actually solve it. You know, like the symptoms continue to come back. Um, one helpful way I heard it was like recurring visitor, insist, insist, incessant visitors or insistent visitors. It's like if I have an anger thing and I keep doing all my strategies, but like it still like keeps coming by, like keeps keeps visiting, then maybe there's some some maybe we're not relating to it in a way that's something's not working, like some something's not uh, really meeting the needs of that anger, you know, meeting what what's going on. Um, Yeah, and then so the other is the other danger with the non-dual, like every that you know, not having this good and bad label is that, you know, the 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 inner, you know, anger, jealousy, the, the kind of passionate emotions, they're volatile. So um, and they can be very harmful very quickly, you know. So um, what do we do? Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I've noticed like one, like when something comes up like that emotion like anger, like for me, like, oh, having a curiosity, like there's an acronym in um, a Western therapy model called acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT. So, which is cognitive therapy. Um, I think it's COAL, C-O-A-L. So when something comes up, C is curiosity, you know, applying curiosity. O is observation. So then bringing mindfulness. So, okay, like, oh, oh, here's anger again. Instead of being like, you know, damn it, here's anger again. Or like, oh, what, you know, God, you know, now what, you know? Like, oh, interesting. And really having like, oh, wow, what's, no, oh, interesting, why is this happening? And then just applying observation and mindfulness and just, okay, like, here it is, and let's just watch. Like, there's like that, you know, like that hypothesis or that question, and then instead of trying to, like, why is this happening? This must be because, yeah, da, 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 yeah. Uh, not going that route, but just pausing and just having, just being observational, Bring some awareness. And then A is acceptance. So then uh, giving that space, I think maybe that's your, maybe your therapist kind of touched on, like just accepting that it's there. Um, but the acceptance doesn't necessarily mean uh, enacting or just kind of, you know, like it's just like, you know, the, the acceptance is like, I'm accepting the emotion. So there, there's two, there's two going on here. There's the anger and then there's the, the person, the subject, me, um, accepting it. So I'm not actually the anger and I don't need to actually kind of run, run with it. Um, and then the last one, uh, L, love. So bringing a sense of kind of love uh, towards oneself. Maybe interesting, maybe having a sense of friendliness towards the, the emotion as well can be interesting. Somewhat be interesting ways of like personifying the emotion. Like seeing like, okay, what's going on? You know, what do you need? Like, yeah. What is this jealousy? Like, you know, having it over for tea instead of like trying to like lock the door, change the locks for a thousand time or whatever. You know, like, okay, like, what is it that you're actually, what's going on? Um, with a sense of kind of uh, kindness um, towards oneself. And yeah, maybe interesting to the pattern, seeing, seeing what can come from that. Um, yeah, 
You know, one way that the other model of the, the harmful, uh, wholesome, unwholesome uh, way that's not, it can be not suppressive is that, so when you're working with a, a strong pattern, emotional pattern that is destructive for you, like addiction, anger, um, whatever, anxiety, um, in the Buddhist tradition, one of the first steps is just seeing, they call it seeing a, the disadvantages, learning the disadvantages, educating yourself on the disadvantages of that emotional pattern or the destructiveness of it. And what the, the desired outcome is a sense of self-compassion. So there's a kind of wariness or seeing like, um, and, and compassion for others too, if it, it, it's harmful, it, you know, it's like, oh, my, this is harming my, my friends, my family, my spouse. Um, uh, but there's a sense of, it's not me. And almost like, I don't deserve this. Or, you know, like, you know, I don't deserve to keep being harmed, harmed by this. Um, and so that starts to bring a, a bit of clarity of almost like a rewiring of like uh, what's actually happening for you. So we might we might have a more superficial level like like oh, I know this is anger is bad whatever anger you know can harm people or whatever but really starting to witness the mechanics and how it's how it's personally affecting your life right now and how it's per personally affecting your relationships not just like in a general sense but really um getting that feel of the impact and so that will start to have clarity of like and they say it's like it's like building a dam before the, the floods come before the floods like building the uh something having something prepared um, and so that's like re-educating yourself and breaking the pattern. So when the anger starts to come up, instead of it just being like a, a kind of a free flow reaction and just the anger just kind of takes over, there's this kind of, um, something inside us says, no, like, no, I don't deserve that. No, like I care for myself. I respect myself. You know, I respect my loved ones, I respect people, I'm not, not so much this time. And that would come from a heartfelt place. Um, so it's not, it won't be, it's not going to be suppressive. It's coming from a, a, a place, a genuine place of compassion from, from within. Because the suppression usually means like the, 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 intent or the motive behind it is fear or aggression so like we're afraid of it so we just tamp it down or you know we have some we're trying to overpower it kind of white knuckle it and so we kind of tamp it down um, so that's the actual problem the suppression and so this other way this other model with the wholesome unwholesome the point is to actually Eliminate that fear and the, the 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 causes of the suppression itself, because we won't. When we know that the pattern itself is not us, that we're not it, that starts to develop courage. Like compassion, one of the, some of the qualities of compassion is strength, courage, um, self-respect. Um, yeah which are antidotes to fear and, and aggression. Yeah, so then then we won't, yeah, we won't have that kind of instinct. To, we won't have that need to suppress it because we'll have the kind of inner resources to actually start to be able to relate to those emotions um, now with more strength behind it. Yeah. yeah, we think about, yeah, suppression usually has, there's a, where we just can't, we don't have the strength and clarity to really be with it. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I mean, yeah, I mean, did I get that going from anger 
to like rage. That's our discussion of, you know, involved like rage is bad, but anger is normal. And, uh, but we had the whole discussion around you know, why do people have to be angry? Like, is that something that is like, if you have to have, you know, and is it, I mean, I I'm obviously follow yeah. more what we were talking about today, which is if you do some fundamental, you know, kind of the, the stage one and stage two stuff, you know, then you don't get to stage three potentially. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, this whole idea of like, yeah, do people have to be angry? Is that like a requirement to be human? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so anyways, that's very helpful, Justin. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so the answer would be no. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so what, yeah, so that discussion what I was talking about is more stage one state, I mean, zone two, zone three. Yeah. Stuff, which is what we're, for the most of the path, that's what we're going to be operating in. So zone two and zone three. The first zone isn't really present in, in Western psychology. That's where it kind of stops. So I think a lot of like cognitive therapies or uh, um, yeah, different psychotherapies, trauma, uh, trauma-centered therapies, they're kind of working in the first, the third zone and the second zone, second zone. The first zone, you can't really get to without kind of the deep meditation practice. So generally speaking, you know, therapist got a point. <laughs> yeah, more or less we're gonna have, you know, anger and things uh, for a long, long time. Until, uh, until, until we have direct realization emptiness. So once we have a direct realization of emptiness, then we uh, um, yeah, we're starting to uproot that kind of reactivity. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so the second zone, these cultivations like loving kindness, compassion, altruism, so they're actually remedying the kind of second zone, unwholesome, that kind of, uh, that kind of deep kind of discontent, self-centeredness, uh, self-fixation, um, you know, kind of the, the, the what's the word? feeling of uh, that I'm not whole, I guess you could say, you know, like, you know, that kind of yearning. Yeah, you can see like these, they're deeper, they're similar, like loving kindness and friendliness, similar, but they're deeper meditations because you kind of have to kind of go a little under the surface to really meditate on, on love, compassion, altruism. They're more powerful states of mind. And then calm abiding goes deeper than just kind of a feeling of an calmness and equanimity because it's kind of the pinnacle of working through uh, subtle distraction and excitement and dullness. So calm abiding practice first, we're like being able to stay with our breath for 21 breaths 
and then we move, maybe we can stay with 100 breaths without our mind wavering too much. Um, you know, at first it's just, you know, flood. And it's like, wow. You know, in the beginning of calm body practice, it's like, it's like, oh, is this making it worse? But no, it's actually, we're just kind of slowing down and realize, getting in kind of a <laughs> clear picture of how our mind operates. We're just getting better. Uh, um, comparison we're seeing like actually our oh, minds really sped up minds will slow down we can stay with the breath for a bit then we can stay for breath for longer and then we start to work start to notice kind of layers of like oh this is i'm i'm kind of i'm with the breath but there is this kind of excitement or you know buzz that i have or or there's kind of a dullness that I have, and this that's slowly, slowly that kind of gets refined. Um, and the uh, tradition breaks them into nine stages. So you're you're kind of slowly, kind of burning through and refining this kind of uh, ups and downs. These really subtle, like ups and downs of of distraction and, and dullness, until eventually you um, attain what. So you call abiding where it's your mind is completely supple, your body is completely supple. So there's no pain when, when you achieve calm binding, there's no aches and pains in the body. So like the, the body's not a distraction, the mind's uh, completely flexible, it's peaceful, it's uh, very blissful and joyful. And they say you can ba basically at that point, you can put your attention onto anything for uh, four hours effortlessly and it's just like clear um, uh, extremely vivid very strong and powerful um, and effortless so there's no there's no more struggle like the mind is just it's just completely present it's very peaceful very very powerful clarity uh, and, and kind of joyful uh, suppleness and so that becomes the the like the, the the perfect companion to um see as deeply as possible so when you have calm binding and you apply that that, that calm abiding towards uh insight into the self or like if you're coming from that very powerful place to call body and you do and you look for the self you look for the nature of the mind when you have a experience of insight it just um so penetrating and the same it, it allows the loving kindness and compassion to just flow very powerfully And eventually that leads to these kind of first zone places where you achieve this kind of, this, or you know, open to non-attachment, non-hatred, non-aggression, um, non-ignorance. And non-ignorance just means wisdom, but it, I think they label it non-ignorance to show it's like the, the absence of ignorance. And so those kind of refine, remove those deeper instincts. Any other thoughts, questions? I'm curious since I'm sort of still beginning phases of all of this, so it's definitely third zone and working with the very chattery mind. Is the progression of zones, is there any clarity on kind of if it's the quantity or if it's more of a quality of meditation that 
effort to refine some of these, yeah, qualities. Thank you. Yeah. I'm in the beginning, say consistency. So if you can start to get, eventually move into like a daily practice, it's kind of the best kind of foundation. You know, so that, you know that takes time. Um, but it's like so short and consistent. Um, so that is a, a quality. Is quality is more. Um, quality is always. Quantity comes when the quality is really kind of uh, established. I think so. You're establishing quality, and then the quantity starts to become. Um, more of a factor or question. Um, yeah, and so they also say, you know, you don't want to push too much. So you want to enjoy your practice. You want to kind of look for You want to find the right amount to where you, you're looking forward to it. Um, you know, how shows like, they somehow always end it in a way that makes you want to watch the next episode kind of thing. You kind of want to do that with meditation. <laughs> not, not, not necessarily creating plot twists or <laughs> in your practice, but you know, having that feeling of, of wanting to do it again. And sometimes we can like push. Um, and, you know, and then that's going to happen too, because we'll get, we'll get enthusiastic, like, uh, you know, really in, in, into it and not push our limits a little bit and, and maybe kind of uh, um, burn ourselves out in the short term. So consistency and that is it's helpful to try to protect and to connect with. Um, yeah, and then in terms of like how it looks like with these zones, um, so like, yeah, we're in the third zone. Like, what is like, what does that mean? Like, how do I work with third zone kind of uh, mind? Um, so you, you know, with any formal sitting practice, we have um, beginning, middle, end. Beginning is kind of uh, setting your intention, kind of framing the practice. So those emotions of optimism, confidence, joy, that's a time to kind of touch into a, a inspired intent. Um, so it's a great opportunity, yeah, to, just to kind of, in, before we kind of get into the challenge of doing the practice itself, um, coming from a healthy place with it, trying to just always tap into why we're doing the practice um, so that it doesn't become motivate, motivated by kind of suppressive, maybe a suppressive intention or, or you know, Yeah, coming from a place that's not kind to oneself. It's like, I want to be different because I don't, you know, I, I don't like how I am. So I, I, I need to, you know, I need to be a Buddha and not be so confused, this horrible samsaric <laughs> being or whatever. Like, it has to come from a optimism, joy, like a genuine place, a, a kind place. Um, and so that can be a third, uh, third zone is just touching into an intent and, and so that's where study comes in, where we can get content of like, what's the basis for optimism? Why should, you know, what's the, what's the basis for joy? What's the, ba what's the nature of my mind? Um, and so studying, studying the Dharma gives us kind of um, fodder to kind of draw on when we do con contemplate to kind of um, um, have a healthy toolbox and clarity um, to draw upon, you know, some wisdom. They call it the, so there's, th there's three wisdom, wisdoms of studying, wisdoms of contemplating, and wisdoms of meditating. And uh, wisdoms of studying is actually just kind of doing what we're doing, like 
going into class together, kind of just uh, taking in the, uh, content. Um, and that is an actual wisdom. Remember, um, there's a tendency to, oh, like, I have to meditate or contemplate on it, but actually just, just uh, consuming positive, wise information uh, is a wisdom in itself. There's, like, Geshe uh, Sopa, um, the late Geshe Sopa, he, he said, you know, the wis wisdom of study actually does kind of have this kind of uplifting kind of blessing on the mind. And, you know, I think like my mind doesn't generate profound positive things naturally, but like, you know, or, you know, whatever. I like it, it, like when the information we consume, like if I read a Dharma text, I'm like taking in, I'm, when I'm reading them, you know, I, I am contemplating, but the contemplation wisdom is more of a deeper, you know, like really set, sitting down, setting some time aside and going into, you know, deeper contemplation. But, you know, my mind's kind of taking in helpful information. So then that allows our contemplation to be um, more potential there. And then, and then, so that's the beginning of the practice, and then the middle of the practice is the actual practice. So, if we're just doing, uh, if we're just trying to uh, cultivate presence, um, then we try our best based on that intention. And then we end the practice with the dedication. Um, and that's kind of an act of generosity. So, we don't get kind of tight with our practice and kind of like it's like we ho we're hoarding our practice or something where it just uh the dedication is ex like um I, I did this practice for everybody i just whatever i just cultivated in this practice like I just give it to the universe i give it to all beings you know may it bring the, the fruits of enlightenment for myself and all beings. So there's this kind of sense of uh, giving, of generosity. Um, yeah. And yeah, and so that actually, and they, they say it kind of seals the practice so it doesn't get contaminated because we could have that practice and then we just get up and move on and, you know, patterns come back and we can kind of just like look they almost say it's like you damage, you kind of lose the container. But this dedication practice, it's kind of almost like seals the container, so it protects whatever that we just did. Yeah. And they all kind of penetrate, just because there's these levels doesn't mean we're not like we can meditate on emptiness right from the beginning, you know, to our understanding, and it can help, which can lead, you know, it might kind of give us a bit more spaciousness, which allows kind of love to kind of come through. Loving kindness calms our mind and nervous system, which allows us to maybe settle more, which then when we think we when we do emptiness practice like then this starts to you know you know speak more to us reflect more deeply some you know some insight might you might see something from a different angle so there are all, all these kind of qualities are kind of interpenetrating and supporting each other um at, at all levels of the our, our kind of development or journey And, you know, and intention, those emotions, you know, um, we can frame our day that way too. We can get, you know, generally it's recommended we, we can, before we get going, even in bed, if we just sit up in bed or maybe lay down, like, um, um, connect them with a sense of intention, motivation for the day. 
So reflecting on these kind of causes for optimism, causes for inspiration, joy, and so forth. Um, and then having that be the container for our day, um, even without a formal sitting practice. And then at the end of the day, just taking before kind of falling asleep, we can um, either review the day and you know, maybe noticing, oh, patterns came up again. You know, um, but also, you know, I, just taking rejoicing in any, taking joy in any, anything, even if it's just, even if I was complete Tasmanian devil all day, like, but uh the fact that i'm dedicated you can dedicate that you're dedicating <laughs> like how awesome i remember to like just to think about my day that's actually a dharma practice like so even if you're like at the end of the day you're just reviewing your day that's a dharma practice and dedicating that you know? yeah Oh, okay. Um, yeah, anything else? Folks. And it could be specific, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, so tight on this topic necessarily. This course is more about getting a kind of foundation practice in mind. And um, how people energy, we want to, we can try a loving kindness practice and maybe finish. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So, um, as what we'll do is, um, we'll bring the mind. Uh, two different people. So first we'll bring somebody we feel close to. Um, and then we'll do, um, try to uh, generate love. And then uh, we'll move on to somebody who's we feel neutral to, maybe somebody, a stranger in our neighborhood or somebody we don't know. And kind of try to generate the same feeling for them. Yeah. So pretty simple. <laughs> not, not necessarily easy, but the uh, technique is simple. And again, just becoming settled and upright in the body. If you like, you can do a few uh, deep breaths to kind of just cleanse our energy a bit. And so if you like, you can breathe in deeply, slowly, mindfully through the nose, taking a full breath. And then slowly exhale through the mouth as if you're blowing through a, a thin straw. You can repeat this three, five, seven times, whatever you like.
And when you feel comfortable, you can switch over to the natural breath. And then you can bring to mind someone you feel close to, to have a busy, friendly, loving relationship with, or close relationship with. Close friend or loved one. Just imagine them present in space in front of you. And just start to get a feel for who they are, a sense of their presence. Their struggles and their qualities. And become aware of their whole person. And kind of humanness. And then bring our attention to their wish for well-being, joy, connection, sense of calmness. Ease. Love. And these qualities are their basic humanity, their basic desires, hearts, desires. Seeing these desires in them, these wishes, and allowing an affectionate love to start to 
arise in us. We begin to wish them happiness. You have joy. May your mind be at ease. May you feel love and connection. Safety can help. Slowly sending these wishes to them. It's helpful you can imagine this warm light coming from your heart as you send them these wishes. When it touches their heart and envelops their body and mind. Bring in this warm love, these qualities. It's helpful you can repeat, you have happiness. And your heart can be joyful, your mind at ease, and so on. And if you can bring the mind a stranger, someone you see around the dondo, and bring their presence in the space in front of you. And in, this, in the same way, becoming aware of their humanity and their needs. And their innate desires for these qualities. And as you become aware, you can begin to send these kind, loving wishes and energy 
come in the same way. May you be happy. May you be joyful. May you have everything you need in your mind to hear. If you like, you're going to begin to imagine this loving kindness expanding out to everyone in your life. Loved ones, your co workers, classmates. Imagine this as light or sending wishes of joy and happiness out in all directions in your neighborhood. Allowing the energy to expand and spread out as you breathe. And then we can drop the contemplation and just stay with the feeling and return to the breath. And we can dedicate whatever positive energy we've created together in this class and practice. May lead us to awaken to our full Buddha potential. And that we may be a lasting value to every living being without exception. To help awaken them to their full potential. May the spring jewel of Bodhicitta where it's not risen, rise and grow. Where it's begun to grow, may it only grow stronger and stronger for the welfare of all. The lives of all of our spiritual teachers belong in their compassionate projects and activities flourish and be successful and benefiting as many as possible.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Justin.